All right. Now, we're moving to chapter 8. And chapter 8 is the great climax of Mark. Because the Mark can, can crudely be cut into two parts. The proof about, about basically the proof text of the logos of Jesus. And then the climatic statement of who are you. And then the proof text of that itself. Of proving that he's basically God. So we are moving and we've, we've moved through this. We're up to the point of basically about cleanliness. Which we're going to get into more detail. But... You know, I, I had the list, I gave you the, uh, what do you call it, the synopsis last time of, of the whole, or the couple of times ago, the whole synopsis of Mark and the proof text. So we're moving basically into cleanliness, and there's bigger issues, bigger fish to fry in this specific point, because as you note, if you have noted, we started with the people of the area, then we added in the grammateus of the area, and then we added in the Pharisees of the area. And then we added in the Pharisees from basically Jerusalem, right? And so slowly, can you see Mark? We missed the point, but Mark is slowly building this um, popularity, I guess you'd say, or, or unpopularity of Jesus among the, the religious hegemony, the religious leaders, because they keep increasing, that is, the, the, their level, their ranks, their, their height of understanding. And so he's, you notice the questions at first are kind of stupid, and now the questions are getting to be more complex. And by the way, very specific. And we're going to see those specific questions because, and I didn't draw a picture, I should probably give you a picture, but he's sticking around the area of the Galil, of, the, of Galilee, right? And so, if you remember, there are four great Pharisaic schools. There's the school of Jerusalem, the school of Babylon, the school of Galilee, and the school of Alexandria. So, guess what happens as we begin to move into the school of Jerusalem, the Pharisees from Jerusalem that we'll see in a little bit. They're not interested in theological questions that we are interested in. They're only interested in one thing. Those are the theological questions that are facing the school of Galil and the school of, of, of Alex, all the schools at this point. And there's a big fight between the Galilean school and the school of Jerusalem. So I can almost guess the questions. Because one of the big fights was, what is divorce? What is uh, uh, resurrection? What does resurrection look like? There's a couple of other big questions that are between the schools of, of Galil and the school of Jerusalem. And so they're going to ask those questions. In any case, let's look at the words of the day. The words of the day are kind of neat. Um, they're going to pertain directly to what we look at. We've already looked at this one or seen this one. K-O-I-N-O-S-A-I. Koinosie. This is uh, plural, but koinia. Koinia meaning common. And your Bible, the NIV and the King James, translate it as unclean or, un, or uncleanliness. But the word means to be common. And the reason this is a very culturally important word, because in the Greek worldview, remember the Greeks are looking for diakosune, right? Do you think any Greek is looking to be common? No. Right, common is the worst that you can be if you're Greek. Because the Greeks do not want to be like the common people, right? Matter of fact, no Greek would call themselves common. Even if you were common, you wouldn't be common. Because they're like us. Everybody's unique, right? And 50% of us are above average. And everybody thinks they are, right? So you got to realize that in the Greek worldview, is very similar to our worldview in some ways. And the Roman worldview. You know, even the slaves in Greece really, you know, rank themselves. And even the most common slave in Greece would probably find something good to say about who they were. That's just the way they are. And remember, they like to lie about it, too, which is another thing I think we talked about last week. Um, P-A-R-A-B-O-L-E-N. Parabolin. Translated parable, but has nothing to do with parable. As a matter of fact, in the Greek, remember, a parable is... A logos to telos that has a singular telos, right? 
And the word parabola, I give you all this stuff for you, but par parabola, a parabola. You know, a parabola, Greeks only believe it only had one axis. So a parabola touches the, touches the axis at one point. Therefore, it has a single telos. Parabola comes directly from the idea of near throne, near throw, to throw near. And a parable in English is very different than a parable in Greek, but we'll see that today. Here's a really interesting word. Um, I threw it in because it, it's completely mistranslated, uh, but you know, you'll guess why. E R uh, in a ephedra, ephedron, ephedron. Uh, it means literally a private place away. It's a privy. For some reason, it's translated in the King James as draught. A draught and a privy are exactly opposite. You don't want a draught from a privy. It's a, it's a toilet. It's an outhouse, literally. Okay? Um, but it's kind of a fun word because it's not translated in any Bible that I could find correctly. It's probably in some, but who knows? Let's see. P-O-R-N-E-I-A-I. -I. You know, that's, that's, that's the thing. You know, we are, um, you know, we're probably the most pornographic culture in the world. You know, it's, it's everywhere. But yet we won't translate the Bible correctly because we're afraid it'll hurt someone's sensibilities. So that's something, right? Porneia. Porneia. Meaning... Okay, pornography comes from this word. It's the feminine of pornos in perni. Uh, it's a base, I'll give you all this basic stuff. It means literally to traffic and dispose merchandise into slavery. In other words, prostitution. Um, debauchee, etc. The word though, the basis of the word is male sexual prostitution. Male sexual prostitution. You know why, right? Guys, female, pr female prostitution is completely legal in, in Judea, completely legal in Greece, completely legal in Rome. That's what you do with your concubine. Go read back and read Judges. What they do with concubines? Concubines is a slave with conjugal rights. But guess what? You want to make some money with your slaves, so they would put the slaves out for prostitution. Totally legal in these cultures. Female prostitution is legal. Male prostitution is illegal. So this word means literally male prostitution, homosexuality. This word, and, and the reason I want to separate them, M-O-I-C-H-E-I-A-I, moyochiea, moyochiea, I think it's about right. Anyway, this is a word that means adultery. This is the word, it is a primary Greek word meaning adultery. So this word means having sex outside of marriage. And this word means literally male prostitution. Because female prostitution is legal. Just so you know. So let's see how this fits. If you remember last time, the question was... Lionel, well, real quick. Uh, if one is true, if both are true, then how can you be adulterous with a female if... That's a great question. Let's talk about ancient marriage. <coughs> you remember, in ancient marriage, if you had a woman, you could do, if you had sex with a woman, you could either take her into your household or pay the bride tax. This is Hebrew. That's true in almost every ancient culture. If you had sex with a woman, if you just found a woman in a field, which is why they didn't leave, if you find a woman in a field in the Old Testament or even the New Testament, there's a reason for it. She's being left there for whatever reason, right? And so if you had sex with a woman, you either had to take her into your household or you had to pray the bride pay tax, the bride payment. And almost every culture had that. That bride payment is prostitution. You paid for the services, basically. But that's not the way the culture looked at it. The way the culture looked at it is you were paying not for services, but you were paying for basically the use outside of marriage. And that was viewed by 
the Jewish culture. The Jewish culture was coming around and changing, but it was viewed by the Jewish culture that way, the Greek culture that way. And so the Greeks thought nothing of, for example, having their woman at home, right? And then having sex with a slave or paying the bride. So guess what one of early Christianity's biggest things they had to change? Remember back when we looked at Thessalonians, first and second Thessalonians? One of the big issues, I think, was sexuality. I think sexuality is a huge issue throughout the New Testament documents. Paul, we, we like to uh, candy coat it, cover it over. We mistranslate it intentionally so that nobody touches that kind of stuff. Because we don't, you know, we're from the Victorian kind of era, right? So we don't think that way. But in the early church, one of the biggest problems was this adultery and, you know, adultery and uh, prostitution and sexual slavery was a huge issue. And so one of the huge changes in Christianity, well, one, one of the huge changes in Christianity, what Jesus said, right? How many women, how many wives should you have? One wife, right? That's a huge change. That's not the cultures. It's not even the culture of the Middle East today, right? That's a huge change. How about the idea about loving women? I mean, not loving them sexually, but loving them, right? That's not in the cultures. There's no word for love in Hebrew. You know, the love, the words for love in Greek don't include women, right? That's just not their culture. So throughout the New Testament, we're seeing a change, you know, where Paul, for example, we mistranslate those terms where it says, it literally says in the Greek that men are supposed to give women the control over their households, you know, the the responsibilities of their households. And what do we translate that as? Subjugate. But yet the same word is used for Jesus under the creation of God as used about women under the household. Huh? Huh? I'm just saying. We have a similar problem, I think, today. I think, the, for example, the Evangelical Church wants to make, wants to translate these things as, for example, men in leadership or men subjugating women. It's like, that's not what the Greek says. And that wasn't the problem in those days. The problem was, was that women were subjugated, right, and abused. And so Paul and the Christian church had a different view, right? Men and women are equal. That's a mysterion concept. Slaves and free are equal, right? You know, that's a very different view than, than their kind of current culture. So what, what I'm hearing you say is that even though the Ten Commandments were in effect at the time of David and Solomon, because they had scores and scores of concubines, the culture did not consider that adultery. Exactly, because remember, in the Torah law, if you had sex with a woman, you could pray, pay the bride tax for her. Right? Now, theoretically... If you had sex with another man's wife, right, that, that supposedly would get you in trouble. Like David. Like David, yeah. But a concubine, see, here's our problem in our culture. Even though slavery was the culture of the world until the 1830s, I don't, you know, as a matter of fact, the only culture that got rid of slavery is Western culture. Absolute fact. And slavery was the culture of the world to the 1830s. But guess what? We, we don't ever teach about slave culture because we don't, number one, we don't want to touch it. And number two, we don't understand it, right? There's this huge thing in our, in our culture that says that we, um, I don't know, there's a huge funny thing going on in our culture, right, about slavery issues and slavery. But yet, we did free the slaves. There are no slaves in American culture. There's no slaves, you know, other than illegal, right? There, we don't allow that in our culture. But every other the culture has it, but not Western culture, okay? But yet, slavery cultures are common. And so, we look at it as an evil thing, right? We've, we've weaned ourselves from that idea of slavery. But yet, slavery is the culture, Right? And a slave does not have the same rights as a human being. Under Jewish law, slaves have certain rights. And under most nation, national you know, cultures, 
they have certain, like concubines, right? A, wit, a woman who has, who's a slave but has conjugal rights. This is a huge deal in their culture. But yet she does not have the same place as a free woman, right? So we just, you know, it's this cultural thing. We've got to get our cultural blinders off and look at the cultures and see how they are. And um, let me see. I'm trying to figure out if there's an analogy to today, if there's a, a common analogy for today that's really similar. I'm sure we can think of one, right, of places where our culture is uh, completely closes its eyes to it. Well, uh, okay, in America, it's illegal you know, if, if you don't have a license, you're not supposed to get married, right? Or have sex. But yet, 50% of our, well, you know, the STDs in our country are amazing. There's 100 million people with STDs, right? Which means people are having sex like animals. And all of that, but 50% uh, of children or more are born out of wedlock? Um, okay, and it means people are having sex out of wedlock, right? But yet, in our country, you have to have a license. Yeah? Well, you're supposed to you not have sex outside of marriage, right? So... I, mean, I don't think they think that anymore. You know, I agree things out with sex. Well, this is exactly like, though, you know, um, according to, according to ancient, the ancient world, according to God's law, the minute you have sex, you're married. But in our culture, you have a piece of paper, right? So all these people are living together who think they're not married. Well, guess what? They stand before the Almighty God, and God says, hmm, well, you're married. And you're married to Harvey and Jim and Jack and John and, and Jill and Jane, and right? Well, what kind of surprise will that be? <laughs> right? I mean, we're not even teaching people this kind of stuff, but it's truth, right? So, you know, our culture views sex outside of marriage as just a normative thing. The ancient Greek culture viewed sex outside of marriage as wrong, unless it's prostitution, concubinage, slaves. What have we turned ourselves into? A slave culture, yeah. If everybody's having sex and running around like animals, then that means everybody's a slave. And they do. They mark themselves and get tats and, and you know, uh, nose rings and everything else, right? And it's like... Sorry, guys. You know, that's tattoos used to mark slaves. Matter, that's what the Nazis marked the Jews with, right? Was tats. So they get their fine. You know what, you know what uh, jewelry was used for, right, in the ancient world? To mark slaves, to mark uh, rank in a culture. And those, noses were, you know, those things were used mostly for uh, animals. So, you know, hate to break it to you, but... <laughs> Oh, well. Let's look at chapter 7. Chapter 7, 14. Um, this was after he said that you nullify. The worst thing that you could do is say that the rabbis had nullified the intelos, the intelos, the completed telos of the commandment for the paradomus of, of man, the traditions of man. And so he goes in, and again, in 14, Jesus Proskeli uh, nomai, call toward himself the crowd. And lego, and lego, listen to me, everyone, and understand. Literally, sun imai, put it together mentally. Put it together in your own mind. Pretty cool thing. How many, um, you know, I'd love to hear, have a pastor say that. Wouldn't you love to have a pastor say that? Listen to my argument and put it together in your own mind. Right? I think that's, a, I, that's what Jesus said, right? Think about it for yourself. I think that's a great concept. Anyway, um, and I don't mean just pastors. I mean, you know, uh, your professors, you know, anybody that's talking to you, right? That's what you should be doing is putting it together in your own mind so you understand it. That's his point. Fifteen, and by the way, it's very Greek thinking. Nothing outside a man can make him koinio, common. It's translated unclean, but common. By going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him common. Koineo. Now, I want to very quickly specify 
that there are other words that Paul could have used, or that Jesus could have used, or not Paul, sorry, that Mark could have used, that Jesus could have used in this text. But the word used, choice used, was koineu, common. In this, we know immediately he's not talking to Jews. He's talking to Greeks. Because if he is talking to Jews, he would use the same word that, it, that Matthew uses about unclean. This is what I get to before. Remember I told you, Matthew and Mark in a translation in English look very similar, right? But the words for unclean are completely different in the Greek. Because Matthew's talking to Jews, and Mark's talking to Greeks. So look what he says. Nothing outside of man can make him koineo common by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. This is turning their culture upside down. The ancient world believed that you were, well, we know you are what you eat, but the ancient world believed they had these cleanliness rules, right? The ideas of cleanliness. There's huge things in this. And this is cut out of your Bible in the NIV, but it's in the King James. 16 is completely out of there. If a man has ears to hear, let him hear. This is also a Greek saying. 17. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parabola. Guys, this isn't a parable. What is this? What is Jesus' statement? What is a parable? What do, what do we think a parable is? A story with a, a story of meaning. You know, like an Aesop's fable. You know, like uh, the 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 uh, uh, killing the goose, or or uh, you know the. The, um, the sour grapes, right? It's, it's, a, it's a story with some kind of meaning. We know in the Greek, a parabola is a logos with a single telos. Did Jesus give a fictional story that means some conclusion? What did he do? He made a logical statement. Yeah, he made a logical, logical argument, a logical argument statement. And his logical argument statement is nothing outside of man can make him unclean. By going into him, rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. That's not a parable. It's not a parable at all. Okay? It is a parabola in Greek, but it is not a parable. After he left the crowd and he entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parabola. And let what he says to them. Are you so a son tetos, not mentally able to comprehend? <laughs> not mentally clear. Are you so stupid? He lego. He didn't ask. Look, this is horrible what they said. He didn't ask. He lego. He lego. Don't you nail. Don't you exercise the mind. It's not don't you see. In Greek it's don't you use your brains that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean, common, quineo. 19, for it doesn't go into his cardia. Now, what's important? Remember, what is cardia to the Greeks? It's, okay, you got pneuma, you got... Suke, and you got sarts. Which is it? Sarts. Now remember, the Greeks believed that the center, the Greeks believed that. And starts is not a bad start because, remember, the Greeks believed that if I had this emotional yearning that I couldn't control, that was also from cardia, right? But in the context we're looking at, 
they're talking about thoughts or ideas. So he goes, he doesn't go into his thoughts or as is his suke, right? And, a, and it would have been cool if he used that, but he used cardia, which is okay, cardia, into his, his thoughts, but into his, his colia, the cavity, the stomach. They translate stomach, the cavity. And then karzio, purging, broma, all food, all food, broma. Broma is a word for all food, clean and unclean, of his aphedron. In other words, you go sit on the privy, you go sit in the outhouse, and it purges out of your body. Now, look what Jesus just did. This is a pre-scientific culture. To totally pre-scientific. Where did Jesus get this knowledge? Because this is not the worldview, right? This is our knowledge, right? We, you know, in those days, did anybody do autopsies? Did anybody cut bodies open? Did anybody study medical science? Uh, yeah, but not for the reasons of study. Matter of fact, the first guy to really study the body was Leonardo da Vinci, and he got in trouble. Remember, he had to steal bodies to, to chop on them because that was considered sacrilegious to chop into bodies. So, you know, even today, if you take a body and start chopping, you better be, well, right? A medical so, examiner? Yeah, or a doctor or somebody, right? So, you better have a license. <laughs> You know, it's amazing how, you know, uh, you can argue, you know, that you don't need a license for anything, right, to the courts now. What would they do? They'd probably ignore you. But in any case, the big deal here is this is a, this, Jesus is relating a post-scientific Greek view here. So did they not realize that when they ate something, it caused them to have a body reaction? Is that what you're saying? I'm trying to figure out what you're saying. You know... Look, they could not perceive contraception, you know, of, of how children were conceived. You know, they had a vague view in the culture and, you know, ideas, but they had no idea, right? It wasn't until the, you know, 20th century when we really fully began to understand the ideas of sex and contraception. We didn't know, you know, people didn't know that blood traveled through the body in veins and arteries. You, you know, you cut one and you cut and, and you bleed, right? But, and sometimes you bleed really bad and sometimes you don't. Well, why? You know, they believed in the melon, in, in the uh, fluids. What do they call them? The, uh, pla the phlegm, the flavors. The four humors. Or the humors. Yeah. yeah, the four humors. You know, blood, uh, melancholy, what? Bile. But, 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 anyway, I remember, but the melancholy, whatever. The, the whole point being, you know, their whole philosophy of science in the world was from that. Remember, until Pat Louis Pasteur proved them wrong, they believed flies came from what? Spontaneous, Spontaneous generation, right? That, that if you left meat out, you know, flies would just magically appear, right? Because they had no idea where, what, how they came, the life cycle, right? The life cycle of bugs and flies and animals. You know, we teach those things to our kids all the time, but they had no idea. So, you know, the idea that you eat food and then it comes out, it's magic, right? You eat it, magic occurs and it comes out. Well, why didn't a baby come out? Why did food come out? Well, I don't know, right? Why, why does urine come out? It's one of the humors of the body, right? So your body is purging its humors. So, you know, and, and why purge blood, right? Remember, in the, in the idea of the humors, and this lasted until the 1800s, you know, you would bloodlet, right, for certain ailments. For certain ailments, you would give enemas or purgatives, right? And for certain ones, you would give, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, things that make you go uh, urinate more, right, or less. So depending on the... The thing, and they, they had problems with bile. They tried to get bile, but don't do bile because you'll die, right? But, it, you know, they had no idea what they were getting into, but this is the philosophy that prevailed up into the 1800s, right? Until the turn of the century, 20th century, and even today, people say, well, don't stay out in the cold because you'll get a cold. 
By saying that, you're like, well, are you living in the Middle Ages or what? Right? You can be the same thing with Jesus here. See? Right? You're probably less likely to get cold from being out in the cold than you are in a warm room with a bunch of people. And watch out for Ebola. So, yeah. yeah. I want you to, I want to tempt you to step into a philosophical pool for a moment. Jesus only, my understanding is Jesus had this conversation with his disciples only once. Okay. Matthew takes Jesus' words and writes it, as you pointed out, in Greek using different words. Yes. It's all inspired by God. So God inspired Matthew to write to the Jews and Mark to write to the Greeks. Is that an accurate understanding of what you're presenting? or In one of my books, my two little girls can read Greek. And so to their pastor, who's an Episcopal pastor at school, they bring their Greek New Testament because they can read it and they love it. And they present it to him and his face falls. Because they teach in English, right? And he asked them, if you want to communicate people about the gospel, would you use Greek or English? And the downcast, they say, well, English, because they wouldn't understand Greek in our culture. That's exactly it. So Matthew taking the words of Christ is, is translating the words to his audience. Okay. And Mark writing to his audience, to the Romans and Greeks, is translating into words that, and, and ideas that they will understand. Because, you know, even though it's all Koinia Greek, right? It's all the common Greek of the time, the universal Greek of the time. We, remember, these are logos to tell us. It's a logical argument to a tell us. So if I want to communicate to you and you're Jewish, but you're a Greek reading Jewish person, my logos to telos has to be different than the one to the Greek-speaking Greek. And, and to me, this is beautiful. To me, this is what, you know, we want the synoptic gospels to be synoptic. And I say, no, I'd rather them be different because if they're different, it proves what? What does it prove if they're different? The gospel's for everyone. Well, not only that it's for everyone, but I have three different accounts. I don't have... Three accounts that come from Magic Q. I have three different accounts that come from three different authors that are thinking in Greek, right? And trying to approach their audiences in a way they'll understand them. Not a cut and paste, cut and paste of a Q. See? And until they find Q, Q is crazy. Okay? Anyone who thinks that Q is around Jesus would say, Are you stupid? <laughs> are you dull? You know? So. That's one of the things I love about this. And this is why when I say, you know, okay, I believe that the New Testament and Old Testament are inspired documents, even though the New Testament is the only one that says it's inspired, or the other way around. The Old Testament is the only one that, that Paul says is inspired, but I do think they're inspired. However, I think we are much better set if we don't touch it with those that are not Christians. If you go out and you say, I have historical documents, so let's talk about it. Boy, you can do a lot with that, right? But if I go up to you and I say, I have, I have documents inspired from God. And what do they do? They pull out their Bhagavad Gita. They pull out their Quran. They pull out their, um, you know, the Japanese towel. You know, they say, well, mine are too. What do you want to discuss? Right? So I think we're on very solid ground if we sit and talk about history. We're not on solid ground when we start talking about inspiration. Danger. So we don't truly have an account of what Christ said. I believe we do. Which one? That's like asking which of the manuscripts of the you know 400 manuscripts is accurate. That's why we have a majority text where we take you know the, our best knowledge and account. And again, I think this is great because the the Catholics view, the Catholics view, the documents is historical. They've always done that. We're the only guys, you know, under Martin Luther's when we started viewing them as inspired, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that. I agree they're inspired. But you have a great question. Are they, are the English inspired or the Greek inspired? And at the end of the day, it's not a 
it's not a make or break situation. I mean, it's it's providing additional clarification for the audience that it was intended. But at the beginning of the day, Mark or Matthew is a primary source, and Mark is sec considered a secondary source, right? right? So which one prevails? Matthew. Matthew. And Luke is considered a secondary source, where John is considered primary. I think it's easy. Like I said, when we look at it historically, boy, the world becomes beautiful and clear, right? And I can and I can even argue with atheists. See? You can argue with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hey, but this is fun, isn't it? I mean, it's really good. I, I think this is fun stuff. He went on in 20. He went on. He lego. He didn't went on. He lego. This is why I hate what we do. He lego. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. And here is, okay, here is a double entendre, if you like. Because Jesus is making a point that is very clear. Because the stuff that comes into the privy is dirty, right? But this is a pun. Because also, what is he doing? Let's see what he says. Listen to what he says. He's going to make sure it's clear. Because if you read this like a Greek would, okay, a Greek reads what? If Jesus says, he lego, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. What, what did he immediately say in Greek? It was literal. The Greeks were very literal thinkers. It's a physical. So, yeah, the snot, the stuff in the privy, the urine, all these are unclean, which is what all cultures agree, right? That's literal. But Jesus is going to make sure you understand he, the pun he means here. Beautiful pun. This is, you know, this guy is so smart, it's, it's amazing. For within, out of men's cardia, thoughts, I want to say thoughts and emotions, come keikos. And keikos means worthless. Keikos, worthless thoughts. And the words, not thoughts, dialogismos. 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 This means discussion. In other words, a discussion of a logos. So from without, from a man's thoughts and feelings, his emotions, come worthless discussion or arguments. Um, We'll see. We'll see. Not th and, and I have a uh, why, why, why I have this note here. Not thoughts, but spoken. What's spoken? Spoken thoughts. Spoken. Yeah, literally. Okay, this is interesting. I want to make sure that I, I have a note here, and I don't think I get it to you. But when he, when he says dialogismos, he doesn't mean the thoughts. What is a dialogismos? It's when I'm talking to you, right? It's a dialogue, yes. We have not achieved consensus yet. Well, in English, thoughts mean what? They don't come out of my head. So in other words, Jesus isn't saying there's something necessarily wrong with, like, temptation, right? He's saying there's a problem with when you begin to do something about it, right? And look what it says. Sexual immorality, literally pornia, pornia, literally sex per pay, especially with males in the Greek worldview. He says, this is what is worthless dialogismos, uh, or doing, or, you know, in, in a dialogismos, I have a logical argument, right? And I discuss it. And then I what with it? I act on it, Right? So the worthless discussion or, or ideas or thoughts put brought out are pornea, sex for pay, especially with males, homosexual, illicit sex. And literally the word is adultery, and this word can also fit incest. Theft is added. They added theft for some reason. Phonos, murder. Phonos is murder. And, um, oh man, why don't I have this illicit? I should have looked up illicit sex. Um, 
Lloyd Chia, sex with males. Literally, sex with males or sex outside of marriage. Sex adultery is what we translated as. Do I have this other one in there? Sexual immorality, illicit sex. Oh, I didn't look that up. I should have looked that up because I, I don't have that word specifically in there. Hmm. Anyway, I think it's another form of porneo. So, of pornea. The, the second one that talks about it. So, in other words, if you look at this, uh, Jesus' greatest problem with, you know, uncleanliness, right? The uncleanliness that he's talking about is the ideas that spew from the mouth. Theologismus, right? And those ideas that are the worst are these sexual immoralities and murder. Theft is in there. Pretty interesting they added that in. In any case, and he goes on. 22. Then, uh, here, this is added in 22. Theft, this is the continuing list. Theft is added here, cloak for stealing. Greed, flanexia, avarice. So I, I guess they just, uh, you know, in the translation, they just uh, mixed up, up a little bit from their order. Greed, flanexia, avarice, literally eager for gain. Malice, and the word here is uh, pornea, is a form of pornea, meaning depravity. Deceit is dolus, trickery. Lewdness, asagias, licentiousness. Envy, and here's, uh, this is another word, porno, porneos, uh, optimalos, an evil eye. Literally an eye that looks for evil. So, uh, pretty interesting. I mean, we have all these porneos forms. Porneos with descriptive items to it. Slander, literally, it's not slander, it's blasphemia, which means basically vilification against God. Arrogance, huperphania, putting yourself above others. And folly is um, aphrosua, uh, literally acting without sense. Acting without thought. So, Jesus first tells him, and he uses this beautiful pun. In Greek, he says, those things that come out of a man make them unclean. Yeah, which everybody agrees with. And then what does he do? He says, basically, the words of the mouth that come out that are of these subjects, or basically acting on these subjects, are those things which are unclean. And I just want to be very clear. Jesus is not saying it's your it's your thoughts or your ideas. It's why it's how you act on them. Jimmy Carter disagrees. Yeah, well Jimmy has probably. We knew that, right? The thing is that in, in this I'm going to this is not philosophical, but I'll expand it in this worldview that we've looked at. In the Sarks, you have pathos, right? Your pathos, your emotions drive you. But Paul and Jesus both say, and this is a Greek worldview, that what do you do about your pathos? You may have, huh? You can suppress it. You suppress it with your with thoughts, right? You, you may have the passions. Level, the higher level suppresses the lower level. Exactly. In the worldview of the Greeks, right, the fated worldview of the Greeks, you are fated, right? So if you see a woman in the field and she's alone and you have desire, you go act on your desire, right? That's pathos. In the worldview that Jesus is talking about, you see a woman in a field, instead of acting on it, you engage your tsuke, and you don't act on your pathos. This is a new idea. This is a completely new idea in this worldview. And you notice that Jesus goes, and you know, this, you could say that this is a parable in the sense, in the English sense, because you notice in the first part, he said that what goes into a man is unclean, or comes, you know, goes in, doesn't make a man clean or unclean, right? But then when he expands it, he expanded it from the ideas of physical, the sarks, into the ideas of the suke, into the ideas of thoughts and actions. 
He goes on, uh, let's see, and this is all the list. In 23, all these porneros, hurtful and evil, come from inside and make a man cornea. And that's it. That's his logos to tell us. And by the way, do you notice something about this? Jesus actually told us a tell us. He gave a conclusion. I think that's kind of unique and interesting. Why do you think he would do that? In Mark, especially. He didn't want us to miss it. He didn't want to miss a point. And you notice that it's repeated twice. It's repeated to the people and then repeated to the disciples. Yeah? Wouldn't this statement also be in contradiction to what the uh, high priest would say about the Jewish law? Of you cannot, <clears throat> it had a long list of things. You can't eat any of these things because they will make you unclean. And this is a direct refute of all of that. It is a direct refute. And did I have the note, or did I make the comment, or did I? I don't think it's here. But there's, in there's that parenthetical statement that says, "I'm saying this to declare all foods and declare all foods clean." Ah, okay. yeah, that's added. Right. That that is an added statement that is not found in the original documents about. Um, in saying that Jesus declared all foods clean. It's found in later documents, but not in the majority text. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, this is something I want you to know. Remember how in the, um, you know, the question of, of uh, should you pay tribute to Caesar? And the answer is obvious if you think about it. You know, Jesus is saying literally, don't pay tribute to Caesar. Well, in this case... It also says don't steal it to Caesar, give it back to him. But, but nothing belongs to Caesar. That's the problem. The thing is that in this case, the author, the writer, did not want you to miss this. Now, who probably added this? Scribes somewhere. The Romans. The Romans, <laughs> exactly. Some Roman added this in intentionally because they didn't want you to miss the point. And what you said is exactly correct, that you know, this falls, this is a slap in the face to Jewish ideas of cleanliness. Because what Jesus says is, it's not the sarks, it's the suke. And, it's, and the suke, when he says suke, he doesn't mean, okay, remember, this is a society when the people pray, they pray out loud. No one prays silently. And when they, when they uh, read, no one reads silently. They haven't invented that yet. Okay, people can't read silently. People can't pray silently. When people do things, they don't, you know, we talk about talking to yourself. I suspect in this culture, people really did talk to themselves a lot. Probably caused a lot of cult cultural issues, right? Because they're, the, you know, and, I, and they're not unsophisticated. It's just, it takes a while, right, culturally, to get to the point where, number one, if you want to think, if you want to think to yourself, what do you, number one, have to be? Literate. Literate. You cannot think to yourself if you're illiterate. What are you going to think of? Right? Just try and think of something. Try, try and think of anything. You, you might be able to think of some pictures, right? But I bet you 10 bucks that you start thinking in word pictures. You begin to develop word pictures in your brain to think. And so to think on the level that we think on, right, you have to be literate. And guess what? 99.9% .9 of the world was not literate for a long, long time. And still isn't. You know, we just have to be literate. Once you're literate, you can begin to pray silently or read silently or think silently. But in an illiterate, illiterate culture, you, people probably talk, mumbling all the time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, wasn't the Jewish culture pretty much literate because of uh, the teaching that they did and they, they, were, they were unusual then in their time. They were. They were unusual. But still we know that they read out loud and they prayed out loud. So yeah, I'm just saying that you know these transitions, cultural transition, it's just like, you know, I show you the, the transit, cultural transitions according to religion, right? And they're very easy to make demarcations in the way that people think. 
And I'm just saying that, that you know, our view is everybody thinks like we do, or, or acts like we do, or culturally is like us, right? But they're not. Even, even in the world, if you go out and try to study the cultures of other peoples, you're going to find they're not all like you or me, right? They're not like our cultures. And so the world is different than we want to imagine sometimes. And what we just need to do is kind of perceive it. And the world is changing. You know, this is a new literature, this new type of literature, according to, um, and that's not me who's saying that, although I, I do say that, but that's <laughs> C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis notes that the Gospels in, are the first literature that mix narrative and sayings together in the, in the world, period. You know, there are some, some examples prior to that, but it's the first that was, you know, basically accepted or, you know, accepted within the liter literary framework and was the basis for all literature in the Western world. That's where the Western world got their ideas for how to write literature. So, you know, this, I don't know, this stuff goes really deep. Let me see. Um, let's see if we have time to do this. Uh, 24. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity, literally the Harayan, the border of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. Tyre, uh, let's see, here's Levant. Here's uh, the Sea of Galilee, and Tyre is someplace right about there on the coast. Um, and this is, by the way, the next, uh, next section of school. Let's see if we can get, get a couple of things here. 25. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter, her Thurgion, a Thurgion, daughterly Thurgion, was possessed by an evil, an Akathartos, uh, not purged spirit, Pneuma, came came and fell, prospito, prostrate in supplication at his feet. This is a child lesson 12. Remember, a thurgion has to be a, um, a dawdling, a thurgion, a child lesson 12. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia, and she eroteo, she told her story. She didn't beg. She eroteo, eroteo means to tell a story, to Jesus, to drive to Ekbala, to eject the demon, the daemon, the god, literally god, out of her daughter, her third daughter. And Jesus said this. First, let the technon, the children of value, literally technon <coughs> means children of value, eat all they corazeto, gorge, literally to gorge. He legoed, he made a logical argument to her. For is it not kalos, beautiful, not right, beautiful, to lambano, to take the technon, the children of values, bread, artos, literally a, a risen, li, risen loaf, and balo, toss it to the cunerion, to the puppies, to the puppies. When you start looking at these words, it's very interesting, because look what the words Jesus uses. He used the word technon, which means children of value, and he said to throw the risen loaf to the puppies. This is, you know, Jesus is right in touch because he is talking directly to this woman, right? And the woman asked for help with her daughter lesson 12. And Jesus used the word not dogs, but puppies. Now there's something very important about this because of what happens next. 28, yes, and the word is nigh. Nigh is a strong affirmation in Greek. In Greek, like in, um, in Japan. In Japan, using hai, hai is a strong affirmation in Japanese, very socially unacceptable depending on the circumstance. In Greek, nai is socially unacceptable unless it's a very strong affirmation. She says, nai kurios, nai kurios, kurios is Lord, equates him as God, kurios. She replied, she concluded for herself in legos, she lego, a logistical, a, a logical argument. But even the puppies, even the curion, the puppies mm -hmm. under Hupeketo, down under the trapeze, the four-legged table, mm -hmm. estio, eat, the children of paidon, a paidon, crumbs, morsels, literally, tion. What's important about this is, look, what does a Greek table look like? Short. It's short. 
What's the only animal that can get it under, that's a dog, under a little short table? A puppy, right? So the picture here is the children around the table and the puppy under the table, right? And look at the words she used. She said, even the puppies under the table eat the paidon, the paidon, literally a child who can't speak. So where Jesus used the word technon, she uses the word paid on. In other words, she included what children? All children. Where Jesus was very specific to the children of value. Who's the children of value? The Jewish children. The Jewish children. So basically a Greek mommy slammed Jesus. And I'm going to... And also I want to note something else. Who's the only people who, that have dogs in this culture? Rich people. Wealthy. The wealthy are the only people who have dogs. Okay. Very interesting stuff here. Anyway, let's start with that. Uh, I'm not going to be here next week. I'm going to be in Paraguay. But I could be, so I don't know. Uh, it's a possibility, but I'll probably be in Paraguay. So we won't have class next week, and then we'll start back the week after next. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray. Amen.